What if every piece of plastic waste, like bottles, bags, and even clothes, could be rebuilt from scratch? No sorting required. Not just melted and reshaped, but broken down to pure chemical building blocks and made new again. That's what a new wave of recycling tech promises. At Northwestern University, a team has built a catalyst that can zero in on a single type of plastic in mixed waste and then break it down. No sorting, no problem. In South Korea, a 2000 degrees Celsius hydrogen plasma torch is cracking mixed plastics in milliseconds, turning them into valuable building blocks for brand new plastics. And in France, an enzymatic recycling plant is transforming previously unrecyclable polyester textiles back into virgin quality plastic feedstock. We've been sold the recycling dream for decades, but the reality? Most plastic still ends up in landfills or the ocean. Could these breakthroughs finally turn recycling from marketing lie into working reality? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. This video is brought to you by Surfshark. We were told that most of the plastic in our lives, from yogurt tubs to plastic bags, could be set curbside in a mixed plastic bin, transported to a recycling facility, and then returned to us on the shelves of a grocery store. But while recycling bins have become standard since the recycling campaigns of the 80s and 90s, actually recycling that plastic has not. I talk about the plastic industry's history of fibs in another episode, but today we're talking about the recent breakthroughs in recycling technology that might finally make a plastics to plastics recycling loop possible. Right now, only about 15% of plastics produced each year get recycled worldwide. And in the US, that figure is just 5%. Humanity has already produced 8 billion tons of plastic, and most of it is still with us, if not within us. So why aren't we recycling? Plastics are made from fossil fuels, which means recycling is always competing on price with freshly pumped oil. Cost is king. A 2020 McKinsey & Company report estimated that with oil at $60 per barrel, only about 20% of plastics volume would make back enough money for private investors to risk building out recycling facilities. And that report landed just as the COVID pandemic sent already volatile oil prices into the negative. So right now, the economics work best for PET, polyethylene terephthalate. Number one in recycling, even though it's the fourth most produced polymer. PET is the clear plastic used for fizzy drinks and water, and it can be washed, remelted, and upcycled into new bottles two or three times before its quality goes flat. But mechanical recycling, as they call it, struggles with contamination, colors, and labels. A lot of that recycled PET doesn't come back as bottles at all. It's downcycled into polyester for fleece and athletic wear. But there's only so many Patagonia half zips a person can use, and eventually it all ends up in a landfill. Today's best recycling practices still can't close the loop. We need methods that can turn plastics into other valuable materials or even virgin quality feedstock for new plastics. And we need to tap into the biggest fraction of plastic waste, mixed polyolefins. About 60% of global plastic production falls into three polyolefin plastic codes. The cloudy high-density polyethylenes, or HDPE, the flexible low-density polyethylenes, or LDPE, and the tough guy polypropylenes, or PP, which, <laughs> yes, still makes scientists giggle in meetings. The chemical similarity between PP and both types of PE <laughs> means they almost have the same density. So in recycling plants, when plastic is ground into flakes, washed, and separated by density, they float or sink together. That imperfect sorting often drags in unwanted hitchhikers like PVC or polyvinyl chloride. Heat that, and its chlorine atoms pop off as corrosive hydrogen chloride gas, which is enough to jam up most recycling processes. We churn out about 220 million tons of polyolefins every year, and production is on track to quadruple by 2050. We've recycled hardly any of them, mostly because we can't cleanly sort one from another. But new chemical recycling technology might finally change that. Led by Professor Tobin Marks, a team at Northwestern University has developed a method to chemically sort PP <laughs> from PE. It's a precision-tuned form of hydrogenolysis using hydrogen gas and a catalyst to crack the long chains of carbon atoms that form the backbones of plastic polymers. So why hydrogen? Well, breaking bonds in a plastic polymer leaves behind unstable fragments that can snap back together in all sorts of random ways. Hydrogen caps the fragments' loose ends, stabilizing them and steering them towards a predictable set of end products. And predictability is everything when you're trying to turn trash plastic into something valuable. 
In the Catalyst, it acts like a reaction whisperer. It makes chemistry happen faster, but it doesn't get used up. And because catalysts can be tuned to target specific bonds, they're what turns a chaotic breakdown into a process you can actually build a recycling system around. What makes Northwestern University's approach so special is that as catalyst snips only PP plastics, <laughs> the catalyst targets carbons near PP's chemical side groups that act like knots along a rope, making the plastic's backbone just a little weaker at each one. And PE plastic? It's left untouched. But with PP cut into pieces, <laughs> PE is effectively sorted out and can be recycled separately. Not only is Northwestern's catalyst specific to just one polyothin plastic, but it's dirt cheap. Most catalysts are made from noble metals like platinum and palladium, but this one? It's nickel. Not even a dime. Its activity is 10 times higher than other nickel-based catalysts, and it does its job at just 200 degrees Celsius, which is about 400 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 100 degrees Celsius cooler than other catalysts. These low temps lead to big energy savings. And when the catalyst eventually wears out, it's not done. It can be regenerated at least three more times with a cheap treatment while still retaining over half its original activity. It gets better. Most catalysts get shut down by PVC contamination, but this one keeps on going, even when the mix contains up to 25% PVC. In fact, PVC actually boosts its activity. That means batches of messy, mixed plastic waste that would have been destined for a landfill or incineration suddenly become recyclable. The catch? This process doesn't turn PP back into the basic building blocks for new plastics. It stops at lubricants, fuels, and waxes. It's valuable stuff, but it's not the closed loop that we've been promised. The dream of those chasing arrows has always been to turn what's tossed into a bin back into brand new plastic. And that's where a very different approach out of South Korea might change the game. But first, speaking of long-term value, another technology I've been relying on for years that's helped to defend my online privacy is today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Not too long ago, I was recently attending a geothermal conference and between hotel and conference Wi-Fi, I leaned heavily on Surfshark VPN to keep my browsing secure and private. I've been using Surfshark for what feels like forever and I get so much use out of it. Surfshark is a fast, easy to use VPN full of incredible features that you can install on an unlimited number of devices with one account. But that's not all. Even shopping services will sometimes gate prices on your location. So you can change your location to make sure you're getting the best deal. They also have add-ons to their VPN service to unlock things like Surfshark Alert, which will let you know if your email or personal details like passwords have been leaked in online data breaches. Right now they're running a special deal. Go to surfshark.com slash undecided or use code UNDECIDED at checkout to get four extra months of Surfshark VPN. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. I've been using it for years, and I love it. Don't miss out on this great deal. The link's in the description below, and thanks to Surfshark and to all of you for supporting the channel. All right, let's talk about that South Korean breakthrough. Led by Dr. Yang Hoon Song, researchers at the Korea Institute of Machinery and Materials, or KIM, say they've built a super hot hydrogen plasma torch that can blast mixed plastic waste back into its basic chemical building blocks in less than a tenth of a second. Plasma is the superheated ionized gas known as the fourth state of matter, and the same stuff that paints the aurora borealis across the night sky. The torches use just hydrogen, no oxygen, so the plastic doesn't burn. Instead, hydrogen atoms bond with the ends of the broken polymer chains, stabilizing them and steering the reaction towards the small molecules ethylene and benzene. That's ethylene as in polyethylene, and it's a building block not just for PE, but for PET and polystyrene, plus plasticizers, detergents, and even antifreeze. Benzene is just as versatile a feedstock, although half of it ends up in polystyrene plastic. Maybe the most surprising part of Kim's approach is just how clean the output is. Instead of the usual soup of 100 different byproducts, 70 to 80% of what comes out of the plasma torch is just those two molecules ethylene, and benzene. And they say more than 99% of that output can be purified into high-quality feedstock for new plastics. If that performance holds up outside the lab, most of a bale of mixed plastic waste could loop right back into the plastics economy. The cherry coke on top is how Kim says the system doesn't require strict sorting or even label removal. The torch can handle a wide range of plastics and contamination. If that pans out in the real-world conditions, it could remove two of the most expensive bottlenecks in recycling, which is sorting and cleaning. Before we can call this a closed loop, there are some loose ends to tie up. 
Running a plasma torch between 1000 and 2000 degrees Celsius takes a lot of energy, and how much that will cost at industrial scale is still an open question. Then there's the hydrogen hitch. Most hydrogen today is still made from fossil fuels without carbon capture. Green hydrogen, which is made by splitting water with renewable electricity, is far cleaner, but currently up to six times more expensive. I've got a full breakdown of that challenge in another episode if you want to go deeper. Still, Kim says the profits from selling and recovering ethylene feedstock made the cost pencil out for their pilot operation. Virgin ethylene sells for about $800 to $1,450 per metric ton, depending on the market. So turning plastic trash back into that raw material could potentially offset the system's energy costs. A long-term demonstration is planned for 2026, and if this mixed plastics plasma torch works as advertised, it could bring us closer to a one bin to rule them all solution for plastic waste. But before we fire up that blowtorch, it's worth asking if that's always the right tool for the job. Making plastic is a multi-step process turning simple chemical ingredients into complex polymers with each step adding time, cost, and chemical elbow grease. Chemically recycling a plastic that only needs melting and reshaping is overkill, like smashing a Lego castle to pieces when all you needed was to move a wall. Still, mixing in chemical recycling can make the whole system work better. A German study found that diverting scraps from incineration to chemical recycling could actually lower overall costs by about 14 cents in euros per kilogram, or about 7 cents in US dollars. That's because the chemical products replace some of the need for new virgin plastic, while cutting down on the cost and energy of burning waste. The best value then is probably going to be a combo meal. Use sorting and mechanical recycling when it's cheap and makes sense, like we already do for PET, soda bottles, and even HDPE milk jugs. Then switch to chemical recycling to handle what's left. But what if those leftovers didn't need a blast furnace? What if biology could take over breaking down PET and even polyester clothes into the building blocks all at low temperatures? Carbios is a company I've covered before and I keep coming back to. Not just because their tech promises bottle to blazer to bottle recycling, but because it's actually starting to deliver on it. Carbios uses a process called enzymatic hydrolysis. Enzymes are biological catalysts, dynamic proteins that get work done. And hydrolysis literally means splitting with water. The enzymes help water molecules cut PET's long chains apart, turning it back into its original ingredients. Terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol. No high heat, no hydrogen, just warm water, an enzyme engineered to chew up plastic, and a little patience. Over 10 hours, the enzymes break down 90% of the PET inside Carbios's pilot tanks in Clermont-Ferrand, France, which I know I butchered the name, but that's where the vessels look more like they belong in a craft brewery than a recycling plant. Those breakdown products are drop-in feedstocks for making new virgin quality plastics. And starting in October of 2025, a shower gel by the French skincare brand L'Occitane en Provence will be 100% made from Carbios's enzymatically recycled PET. These enzymes aren't just giving soda bottles a second life, they can take on polyester clothing too, even those mixed fabrics that stump recyclers. Carbios teamed up with Puma, Patagonia, PVH, Solomon, and on to test their toughest materials, polyester blended with cotton, elastane, dyes, and water repellent coatings. Carbios's recycled feedstock became new polyester, spun into fresh fibers and woven into a plain white t-shirt, even though the original scraps look like a bag of Skittles. That's a huge deal because polyester is fashion's favorite fabric, mostly because it's cheap. But despite the low price tag, it comes with a heavy carbon tab, over twice that of cotton. If Carbios can close the loop here, every shirt could be a comeback story instead of a one-hit wonder. But just because it can be done doesn't mean it will. Carbios is building a plant in Longueville, France, that will recycle 50,000 metric tons of PET each year, or roughly 300 million t-shirts worth. With that scale of recycling under its belt, it plans to license its tech worldwide and already has letters of intent signed in the UK, Turkey, and China. So what's it going to take to go from promising demo to the global standard for PET recycling? Well, in the extended cut of this video over on Patreon, I go over how industry trends and policy changes are finally aligning to make Carbios's new plant possible. And spoiler alert, plastic recycling isn't inevitable. It takes policy like penalties on virgin plastics and real incentives for recycled ones to give these emerging industries the lift they need to grow and scale. Chances are we'll need a toolbox of recycling methods, with each one tackling different plastics at different stages of their life cycle. I'll be watching to see which ones break into the mainstream, but my hunch 
Sorting still wins on cost and energy use, keeping the easy, high-value stuff in tight loops, but having a plasma torch in the wings to zap the leftovers? That's an exciting prospect. Still, recycling isn't a get-out-of-jail-free card. Every step from hauling and sorting to washing and reprocessing, it all takes energy, a lot of it. And none of the methods we've looked at today are 100% efficient. Some plastic will always be lost along the way, meaning we'll still rely on new fossil fuel inputs to keep up with demand, and demand is only going to go up. Some stuff just shouldn't be packaged in plastic in the first place, and glass and aluminum can be recycled almost forever. For single-use items, compostable bioplastics made from mushrooms or even seaweed could help cut our dependence on fresh fossil fuels. I've got an episode on plastic alternatives if you want to see how that's shaping up. But plastics still have a place in medicine, transport, and everyday life. And if these new recycling breakthroughs scale, they could finally unlock circularity for plastics destined for the dump. But what do you think? Is plastic recycling finally within reach? And are these the kinds of breakthroughs that can get us there? Jump into the comments and let me know. You can also check out the extended cut of this video over on Patreon. And if you'd like to join, the link's in the description. Be sure to listen to my follow-up podcast, Still To Be Determined, where we'll keep this conversation going. Keep your mind open, stay curious, I'll see you in the next one.